Welcome back to Still Potable, the best Celtics podcast out there on the internet. We are coming to you live after game three. The Celtics take down the heat 104 to 84. Hold on, hold on. I need to interrupt you. Wait for it. Wait for it. The anticipation's building. Let's go. Let's go, you motherfucking Celtics. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Your motherfucking Celtics, let's go. Let's go, baby. It's game three. Let's beat the heat down in Miami. Let's go, Celtics. No more farting. Double fuck you to Caleb Martin. Let's go, Celtics. Let's go. Let's go, your motherfucking Celtics. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Your motherfucking Celtics, let's go. Woohoo! New lyrics. I was not prepared. Updated version for game three. What that's, a curveball. That's amazing stuff. Amazing that's curveball. Things you get here on the best Celtics podcast. We are doing this live on the CLNS YouTube page. We are powered by prize picks. Use the code CLNS. You'll get a hundred dollar deposit. I am Sam Jam Packard. He is Brian B. Rob Rob from MassLive.com. We were joined by Jay King, the father from Miami from the athletic and Jay, you were in the building. So I'm going to turn it to you first. So what was your reaction to the Celtics going returning to form here uh, and pretty much, pretty much dismantling the Miami heat in game three. That's more like it. The aggression on defense, the decision by every player on the roster to just be more aggressive, pick up, pick up, pick up harder. Play, play defense. There were better closeouts. They stopped. They held the heat to only 28 three-point attempts, I believe. A lot of those were difficult tries. There was no more walking into wide-open threes. There was no more one-pass, guys wide open, let it fly. There was no more comfort for the heat. And that's how they should treat the heat. You don't have to have too much fear, too much respect for this team. I mean, you, you have to respect them, but you also need to just just dismantle them as as the Celtics did tonight. I thought their defense from the start and the offense took a while to get going, but that first quarter they absolutely locked down the Heat. They held the Heat to twelve points the entire quarter. There were definitely a few like decent shots missed by the Heat, but for the most part, it was just a totally different defensive effort, totally different defensive mentality from Boston. And I thought you know the the offense came ended up coming along. But it was a defense that that was there from the start, and it was a defense that that really needed to change after the Heat just drilled a ton of threes in Game Two. Yeah, I think Jalen Brown put it perfectly to you guys in Miami, Jay, when he said, "Just no more dare shots." I think that was like the kind of the story of the night because that was when we look back at the Game Two film, like Miami had good offensive points, but there are also times where it's like, "Where why isn't there even a half-hearted closeout here?" And that just went away tonight. And taking that part of it away and Miami's other shooting regressed to the mean. They missed some open shots, especially in that first quarter. But the tone was changed out of the gate. And that definitely set the stage for what ended up being around here. And they made everything tougher. Like, the, everything was just at a different level of intensity. Um, and it sort, it sort of reminded me, this is going to be a weird comparison, but it sort of reminded me of last year. I thought their defense was never able to really make teams uncomfortable. Like, they, they just allowed teams to get a rhythm. They allowed teams to get a flow. And and game two was sort of like that. But game three showed the difference to me in this team where they can ramp it up and they can take away 
take you out of what you want to do. And they can force you into ugly nights. They they picked up full. Like, how many times did the Heat throw the ball away in the full court just because the Celtics were pressuring? And obviously, with no Jimmy Butler, with no Terry Rozier, this Heat team doesn't have a ton of ball handlers, a ton of guys capable of handling that type of pressure. And when Drew Holiday is hounding you, when Derek White is hounding you, when Jalen Brown is hounding you, like, that's going to be a lot to deal with for 48 minutes. And I just thought uh, you forgot one guy there, Jay King, who was hounding the fuck out of people. He checked in with about seven minutes left in the first quarter. And I thought it was phenomenal. It was Peyton Pritchard. Peyton yeah. Pritchard came and like had just played with fantastic defensive energy and was hounding every single heat ball handler. He forced Duncan Robinson into just a, a bad turn. A number of just like, I would say uncare, not necessarily uncharacteristics, but it's a number of turnovers from the Heat, and I think the Celtics did a fantastic job of turning those turnovers into points. Um, Twelve total turnovers for the Heat, twenty-four points uh, for the Celtics off those turnovers. That's a pretty high conversion rate, uh, just in terms of turning those possessions. And I really thought Peyton Pritchard came in there, especially like one of the first subs off the bench that, uh, and just gave them a much needed boost uh, just in, ter- in terms of maintaining that defensive intensity for basically that entire first half. And that was after right. a game too, where the bench was pretty much a non-factor. And one of the things Joe Mazzula said before the game, before game three was basically, we need to find ways to, to make our bench impact this series. We, we need to find ways. He thought that the switching that Miami did, sort of took away some of what the Celtics like to get to with that bench. And and he thought that they needed to find a way to imprint the game, and and Pritchard did that. He got to the basket. He was hollering. I, I, I'm I pretty sure he has, like, a rivalry inside his own head with all the white guys in the league. <laughs> <laughs> did he did he threaten to – Stan Van Gundy told us he threatened to fight Tyler Hero and meet him after the uh, in the hallway after the game. I'm, in his own head with every white guy in the league from hero duncan robinson like pritchard just just really wants to be the the top white guy in in the league but yeah i i thought he was awesome i thought he was another guy who just totally ramped it up um and porzingis uh, again i thought the response from porzingis after his game too was really really strong yeah you you know it's a pritchard game when he just has comes up with two offensive rebounds in the trees in just traffic nowhere in, in traffic, traffic you're just yeah. like where the hell how and one of them was like he looked off the defense afterward and pretended like he was going to pass it out and then went up to get the bucket i thought that was that was nifty Ooh, yeah that's it a five dollar word right there jake and it's funny Jay, like and that like him in that lineup too like the pritchard like Hauser, Horford, Tatum, Drew lineup. I feel like that is where they were like, dominant they, in the second quarter, right? And that was the one lineup that kind of worked in Game Two at points. That kind of got them back in the game a little bit, but then it seemed like they rolled with that a lot. And State of Pritchard, Joe, to his credit, I think State of Pritchard even longer for that second quarter stint, and it paid off because that's where they really started to separate themselves, and that's when the offense kind of got flowing too. And and Pritchard and and Tatum were a big part of that. And then, like you said, you know, like Porzingis, too, the beginning of that game just throughout it was just just like a an efficient, solid night. I thought defensively he was just damn good, too, with his rim protection and just making life tougher for Bam with the contests and not – and even the drops, like, just was just played smarter game overall, it seemed like. Yeah, the, and the, the play where Bam tried to put him right under the rim and actually did put him right under the rim, but Porzingis was still able to stop him. I thought that just showed like he was ready for the fight. And and I think because he's rarely played in the playoffs, because he has a different role on this team than he has in the playoffs in the past, I just think it's going to be sort of a learning curve for him. He's going to see stuff that he hasn't really seen before. He's going to play a, be playing a level of basketball that he hasn't seen, and that's not necessarily right now, but will come later. And I think it'll be like, like some ups and downs for him. I don't expect like a smooth ride for Kristaps throughout this whole thing, but he's shown throughout the year he can he can pick up stuff quickly, and and typically like he doesn't have like long slumps. It's just like one game, then he snaps back, and tonight was a snapback game. He scored the first eight points of the game, and I think that was important to him kind of getting into the flow of things. I thought they just did a good job of like 
reacting to the um hero bam pick and roll and just letting him kind of be in that drop and if hero wanted to attack the basket you kind of have to finish over chris taps Porzingis. he picked up a couple blocks there um jay you mentioned kind of an ugly first quarter where they hold hold the heat to only 12 points but they didn't really convert themselves um and we're only up i think 21 to 12 i thought tatum came in um with that lineup we just talked about um and just really did a great job extending the lead there and kind of taking over the heat tried their zone. And it feels like the Celtics are very, very comfortable uh, in terms of beating that zone and just like finding a way to get Hauser open in the corner. Um, and then Tatum knocked a, you know, he kind of bailed out a possession with a late three, but I just thought he had a really good second quarter. And then towards the end of that second quarter, I think the heat Other fucking white. Yes. Absolutely. He had the putback on the missed free throw by Jalen. He's just causing chaos and transition. He was just uh, phenomenal. So I think Tatum had 13 points in the quarter. A lot of that coming at the start. And then Derek White, who was pretty quiet in game two, made his presence felt towards the end of that second quarter and really extended the lead. So they went into halftime with a, a 24 point lead. I thought it was just the two of them really picking up on offense was what they needed to do um, with the heat just kind of shooting so poorly. And then in the third quarter, it felt like they just, just ran more through white. They they went to some pick and rolls with him. They just kind of activated him. And I thought that was necessary. You know, he, he wasn't really too big a part of things in game two. And, and he needs to be. A lot of their best offense comes through Derek White, whether it's him looking for his own or him getting others involved or him just being in the action and being the connective piece to make things easier for everybody else. Um, I thought his run in the second quarter when he hit the three, he, he had that awesome play you talked about. He was just like he, he really opened things up for them toward the end of that second quarter. And and just kind of put the heat away. And obviously, the heat made it a little closer. Um, they got to like, what was it, 15? I think 15 or 14. Something like that in the, the third quarter. But but he just, they they had the answers every time. And, and a lot of the times, it was Derek White. Yeah, that's a situation with, and for him, when he took out a bigger role here, like I feel like Drew Holiday also kind of stepped back and stepped into no, more of the, and that was big. And as you said, Jay, like he made a lot of you tweeted this out, like he made a lot of great passes all night here. But the the Celtics' best offense is when Derek White needs to be the third at worst fourth option um, with that starting group. Drew Holiday for all he does, for all the shooting he does, he just especially this against the team like Derek White is a better creator facilitator, like creator creator like driver right now. And this was a night where kind of everything kind of fell back into place in that front, it seemed like. And it just felt like there was more flow to their offense. And and even in the first quarter, like they they didn't score a lot, but it was they were getting to stuff easier. They they weren't falling into the Miami trap of like like melt melting down the shot clock, being late in the shot clock, trying to force it to to guys in a crowd. They did a great job. I thought there were a number of times, whether it was Al Horford that they threw it to or Chris Stops, they would they would find those guys in the middle, and then those guys would just quickly pass it out. And and I just thought the way they they handled Miami's help and the way they handled all of that was just infinitely better. They didn't slow down. They didn't get caught up in this like in the muck. They just played their own game, made quicker passes, quicker decisions, and and just just sprayed the ball around to guys. There wasn't wasn't as much like super methodical try to get to a matchup type stuff. It was like let's run through our offense and let's get to that matchup organically. And and I thought there was a huge difference in in just the the way they played on both ends of the court, um, including the offense. I just thought it was night and day how how they just did what they wanted instead of letting the heat dictate things for them. I haven't seen the numbers of, in terms of after this game, but in game two, I think they only got nine paint touches for the entire game. And it just felt like their inside out game, as you mentioned, Jay was a lot better. And it was just like Derek white, I think, especially there in that third quarter, I have in my notes, 
Derek White is just running shit. And it felt like in terms of just like if they're going to switch a bunch, it's on the Celtics offensive players to win their individual matchups. And that kind of play that sticks out to me is like Caleb Martin was pressing Derek White yep. high and Derek White just dribbling around, dribbling around, dribbling around and eventually just like determined I'm going to get to the cup and eventually got by um, Caleb Martin for that bucket. And that kind of led to more Derek White. I think he had a pull up over Jovic the next possession then kind of add some passing there, but it felt like the Celtics were much more focused on just like, let's win that individual matchup. Let's get it into the paint and then let's kick it out. They didn't even shoot very like uh great percent tonight. And normally the Celtics are not good when they shoot such a low percentage, uh, I think below 30% from three. And so I think it's a good sign. It's also the playoffs. And so they don't need to necessarily put up uh, 120 points. It also helps when you hold teams under below 85, which is kind of a, an insane number. But they I just took the they they took the luck out of it. You know, there was all this talk about shot luck, about the heat. You know, obviously it was a a rare game where they hit 23 threes. I think it was a franchise record. They're not going to do that every time. The Celtics just took the luck out of it. They made sure that the Heat weren't weren't getting those same looks. They made sure that you know they didn't sell out as much to shut down Tyler Hero and, and Bam Adebayo and like send as, as much help, but they were still great on those guys and and really were able to hold them to an efficient inefficient night. I think they had 35 points on 34 shots between them. And Hero did some shot making, but he's going to do that. And at the end of the day, I think he had 15 points on 16 shots. So they didn't send him to the free throw line. They, they were able to do a great job on him while also taking away the role players. And Duncan Robinson, he only played seven minutes, but he didn't get up a sh- three-point attempt. Um, Caleb Martin only had, I think, four shots in the whole game, and they did a great job on him. One of the possessions that stood out to me was Al Horford in the corner guarding Caleb Martin. And every time Caleb like started to look like he might shoot, Horford just took away the space. And those were the shots that the Heat were able to get to in game two those were the shots that Caleb Martin was able to get to last season in the playoffs and Horford did such a great job in isolation on that that one play and I think I think that was the play where Caleb Martin just kind of lost it out of bounds and and Horford was successful and I just thought there was a totally different level of not necessarily focus but just the intensity on on all of the role players to just make sure that they they weren't going to get off, and and they they just did a, a really nice job shutting them down. I, I'm glad that you brought up that white play uh, on the offense because that was sort of like like they were he was trying to run offense. <laughs> he was trying to run some sort of set or play or something, looking for a teammate, and then it was just like fuck it, I'll just go by Caleb Martin, get all the way to the rim. Nobody was was in good help position. They were all denying the ball elsewhere. And White just decided to go make a play. And sometimes you just need to be an athlete, go need, need to go make a play. Derek White was yeah. awesome. I mean, they were, given how physical this game was, like the Heat were up in weight, whoever had the ball for most of the time in the half court in the situations. And what amazes me is the Celtics only had six turnovers in this game despite that. Like they were manhit on a lot of these spots, but they played solid, they played smart, they played patient. And plays like white where it's like, listen, okay, you want to do this? Like, I'm faster than you, like, Mark, like I can get by you. Or if another bigger defender's going to be on, like, I can make the right play in this situation. And and for the Celtics to do that, that's like the third fewest turnovers they've had in a game all season, period. Like, yeah. that's that's a pretty damn good thing against a, a pretty ga- damn good Heat defense. We even had a J, like, you just talk about the intensity, Jay. We had a Jalen Brown block of a three-point shot. Like yeah. that just talks yeah. about like the in, like how they're treating open threes and kind of like the the closeouts there. Um, it was just an all around good game, uh, except for Drew Holiday, who did. See, <laughs> he was he was very good on defense, but he, he made some decisions. How are you going to say that Drew Holiday did not have a good game? It was a you joke, Jay. It was a, for comedic effect. You have blinders for good passing. How are you going to say that? How how are you possibly going to say that? Because he made some of the wild uh, choices. I have a podcast with someone who doesn't know ball. 
I have a podcast with someone who has no idea what helps win basketball games. Don't tell me, speak pose. Tell me what Drew Holiday did today. Uh, did Did you watch? No, did I'm you? I'm I'm just asking for the viewers. I was there. I watched. I know what he did, but I wanted you to tell me. <laughs> he was out hounding Jaime Hake. He was out switching from one Heat player to the next and doing so with insane level of physicality. Drew Holiday didn't have a good game. Go fuck yourself. He only had three points, though. Two turnovers. A third of the team's turnovers? That's not great. Who cares? Are you serious, <laughs> Packard? Made some tough uh, decisions there. Oh, man. I there, was one, there was one play where I, like, I think it was in the first half. It was a Jalen Brown. Um, I think he had a nice, like, layup after a steal, but I was Guarantee, I knew Drew Holiday was going to pull up for a three there, and he actually made a nice layoff pass to Jalen Brown. Uh, that was so a great maybe, play. Yeah, he backed it off in transition to create the angle to throw the pass to to Jalen. Then he finished the M one. Another great play by Drew Holiday. You, I cannot believe you said. I'm truly <laughs> that hurt my soul. Yeah, no. Are you are you are you calm down? Uh, are you ready for our the the next portion yep. of the podcast? Because right now we're going to go to the still potable legend joshua b uh so hopefully he can calm jay down joshua b how are you doing i'm i'm unbelievable but i think i'm gonna end up getting jay riled up you know since let's do it rile podcasts. him up rile oh, him up i think i can i mean he hosts two podcasts with people who don't know ball i've heard zach harper um <laughs> definitely yeah For um, personal attack. i'm the only one allowed to make personal attack here josh <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I guess what I'm here for, I'm, I'm here for two questions. One is a little silly. One is a little serious. And we'll start with the serious one, which is up until this point in the podcast, I haven't heard you guys talk about um, Sam Hauser getting the ball thrown at him by Tyler Hero or Derek White getting punched yeah, in the I'm face. Oh, yeah, baby. And these are instances that I remember just last year, much less in the finals two years ago when Draymond Green used Jalen Brown as an Ottoman. Um, where the Celtics would just come mentally undone. I mean, I've, I've seen this happen in multiple series where little things like this just so, totally derail the mental the mental toughness of the Boston Celtics. And instead, tonight, the Celtics not only kept their composure, but they were very aggressive um, on defense. They continued to um, be physical, take the fight to Miami. That's a huge shift in the tone of this series, at least in my eyes. Do you guys see it the same way? Do you not see um, what I'm seeing? Where did you come down on that? Especially after last game in which they made 20, in which they set a franchise record for threes and were able to get all kinds of space. Does anyone have an answer? I was lo looking for Jay pressing the buttons there to step in. I, I don't know if the tone of this series has necessarily changed to me, because I don't know, I'll, I'll wait till game four because the Celtics have done this with the heat. They've had a played a shitty game and they've responded well in the next game. I think this is the kind of the best response they've had in their number of series against the heat. And just in terms of like dominating the game, game two really shouldn't have happened. They like, it shouldn't have taken their foot off the gas, but I'll kind of see if the things, the tides have turned if they come out in game four and do the same thing and don't let their foot off the gas, because yeah. I'm still waiting for the Celtics to like, not, not like be just up, up a game and kind of just take that for granted. If they kind of come out with the same intensity, the same energy um, in game four, then I feel like something will have changed. This is what they're supposed to do. You're one, one against the eight seed that doesn't have Jimmy Butler. That doesn't have Terry Rozier. That doesn't have a whole lot of offensive creation. You need to take take control of the series. You need to come in and take game three. Cannot go down. Cannot revive the the memories of Eric Spolstra and all the all the nonsense that has gone on against the Heat over the years. So this is what they were supposed to do. To me, like there's not much they can prove in this series, but it would be a bad sign if they come in in game four and and lay a dud and and let their defense slip again and let the heat muck them up and get get caught up in the trap of all the all the traps that Eric Spolster lays. So I, I just think this was a great 
mature response out of them, but this is what they're supposed to do against a Heat team without Jimmy Butler. This this Heat team should not be able to score against Boston. And I think if Boston plays this level of defense the rest of the series, it will be a quick series. Are you saying the Heat don't have any adjustments they can make? I'm not saying they have no adjustments they can make. I am saying that they should not be able to score. <laughs> They, yeah, I I agree. <laughs> Patty Mills adjustment in Game Four. He he played some in the fourth quarter. And I thought he played the I, entire fourth quarter. <laughs> on top of the threes, just he was a pest. He he was trying to take charges. He was throwing himself into Jalen's arm to take a charge. He was kind of doing some Kyle Lowry type stuff out there. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some Patty Mills in Game Four to not just add some shooting and some some spacing for them but also to just cause chaos i mean you know like it all comes down if the defense shows up the rest of the series the series is over like that's it like with this is a top three nba defense against the heat team without two weapons like that's it like that and we just see it all comes down to the intensity level that's the thing that Celtics can control shots might not fall they shoot 29 percent for three tonight they shoot like shit in the first quarter um, but it didn't matter because the Heat couldn't score and the Heat couldn't score consistently all night long. And if this continues, like this series needs to be over in five games for a lot of reasons. You look around the Eastern Conference today, guys, like things we talked past years, things are really looking up for this team now. Like this could be as a dream path for the Eastern Conference now, based on the injuries pop- popping up left and right now, right now, and dragging on a series uh beyond five games when it looks like magic Cavs could go six or seven right now that that could be a big boost for this team so that's all the more urgency now to just take care of business and let these other east teams beat up on themselves uh we didn't we didn't dive into the great uh beef of wisconsin white men of tyler hero throwing the ball at sam hauser um a lot of yapping from tyler hero when he was, was what i think five of 13 from that point five turnovers I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. I, I, I've never been a big real fan of Tyler I, Hero, but I enjoyed it. It was it was fun. Beef is fun. I liked it, it because it pr- made Peyton Pritchard threaten to meet him in the hallway. And anything that gets that response out of Peyton Pritchard uh is all right with me. I think it was the start of the fourth quarter. They came back and they were just like uh focusing in on the Celtics. And Al Horford was just behind Peyton Pritchard saying something in his ear, and Peyton Pritchard was just nodding kind of smiling maniacally just being like yeah Al, i'm going to kill him i'm gonna do it and i thought i love that intensity um from playoff p i thought that was uh fantastic stuff and you know what it's gonna things are gonna get chippy it's the playoffs it's the celtics heat uh you know i thought i like that stuff's gonna happen especially uh in a playoff series so i thought that was fun good times all around good time Jay, you were in the building. Any other observations from the game or any of the post-game press conferences? Um, anything from, you know, you're the live reporter down in Miami. What do you, what do you have for us? The uh, It just seemed like a, a business-like performance. Um, I thought from the other day when Al Horford said, like, they have our attention. That that just kind of set the tone for, for these couple of days set the tone for game four or game three rather like they have our attention watch what we do now and and it was interesting to hear the guys say that they didn't really make many defensive adjustments because it looked pretty fucking clear that they did (laughs) Um, but yeah missoula was like no you use adjustments too much this time of year we didn't do anything different it's like Jalen brown had a block on the perimeter he was not doing that closeouts and allowing guys to step into wide open threes they were up in people's shit and forcing turnovers at least in the first half and just making Miami miserable and that's that's how they should play that that is the level of defense that they should always play I just thought they they laid back in game two and in game three they took the fight to Miami they they were the ones setting the tone. They were the ones being more physical. They were the ones dictating what Miami's offense did instead of the other way around. So I just thought it was a 
it was a great response um, from a team that that knew it needed to play better, that that knew it needed to up up the defensive pressure, and and that's what you want to see for now. But but the the level of competition will get better, and it, it was it was probably important to just like get this game and just kind of start to distance yourself from like, oh god, <laughs> what if this happens again to Miami, and what if it happens to this Heat team with no Jimmy with no Terry Rozier with like that would have just been bad. That would have been terrible. So they needed this one. B Rob, you got any other observations before uh, before we get stupid and silly with it with the junk drawer? Beyond that, no, I mean Luke Cornett, he's back back. On, back in action. Five three big minutes in the first half when Porzing has gotten foul trouble there. Um yeah, so g- game changing, game changer. We'll see. We'll find out as as the playoffs go on here. But good, to, good to see him back on the court. Other than that, I mean, it's inter- I mean, we'll see. Delon Wright. I mean, didn't really change much, but that he has played well in this series. And him randomly missing. I mean, he had he was out for personal reasons. We so we'll see if he comes back in the series. But that certainly uh, hurt Miami tonight when they couldn't get anything going there. So that's uh, you know, that'll be something to to watch here for a very pivotal game for coming up Monday night. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like the only the final thing I'll say about the actual game is I just thought Chris Taps was great defensively tonight. I don't know how many blocks he finished with. He had at least two that I can remember. Yeah, he had two blocks. Um, what was a presence around the rim, and I thought he got it a little bit going there in the fourth quarter when the the offense kind of uh, was slowing down. Um, just playing more physical and actually drawing some fouls. I don't think his post up. Like the way I thought he was going to play and the, how I thought they were going to attack switches was like going to a lot of Chris Tapp's post ups against smaller guys. Clearly, that's just not working for them. Like, I think he's catching the ball just too far from the basket. Um, but I thought he got some of that game going um, more so in the fourth quarter. It was just able to draw some fouls. And I just thought he played a much better game. Um, and it gets back to your point, Jay, that like, he is going to be very important, and I think, yes, I think his offense is important and his three-point shot making just spaced out the defense, but him being solid defensively and being a rim protector and playing BAM and contesting without fouling, they had to go to Luke Cornette tonight because Chris Tapps picked up those two fouls early, and so I think um, it really starts for this team on the defensive end, and I think Chris Tapps playing a solid role in that and being a, a good rim protector without fouling, I think will go a long way to them kind of having continued success uh, as they move forward in the playoffs. Yeah. Jason Tatum called him the most important player to what they're trying to accomplish. So that shines a spotlight on just how crucial he is and how crucial his level of play is to, to what they're trying to do and where they're trying to get to, because when he's right, he changes them on both ends of the court. When he's right, there's not really a whole lot of answers for Kristaps Porzingis or for the Boston Celtics. So, it's it, I, I I just think this is this playoff run is going to test him, is going to make him better, and and if he can rise to the challenge like he did in in Game Three, then the Celtics will have a lot of answers for a lot of different types of coverages teams will throw at him. I concur. Um, I know you got to go right, Jay, so we'll get to the junk rather quickly. Jimmy Butler had that fun interview. Uh, I don't know. I was watching the TNT feed. He was interviewed like during the middle of the uh, first quarter and said he was sick of the Celtics getting all that talk about them, and they're about to go win the game. I hate Jimmy Butler. He had a stupid haircut. Um, he was the original price gouger uh, in the bubble where he's charging $20 for a cup of coffee. Um, I've had enough of him. And why do we do, why are we interviewing players during the middle of the game? When did we start doing this? I think it's stupid. It's what? It's what they do now. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I hate Caleb Martin. Um, that it was a fun give and go with Chris Tapps, Porzingis and, uh, Derek white. Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful play. Um, the commercial where Jokic has a pony and they're playing pony in the background on the piano. It was a nice touch. I didn't recognize that before. Um, Shaq talking about the Wagners. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this on TNT, but he was just going crazy about the Wagners. 
Jay, I know you're a big Mo Wagner fan, so I thought you'd uh, uh, appreciate that. Um, Jalen Brown with a 360 dunk after he got fouled on the floor by Bam. I thought that was very unnecessary, but I liked it. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then finally, uh, the, a question for Joe after the game. Uh, the guy said there's four guarantees in this world. <laughs> Life, death, taxes, and a spicy series between the Celtics and Miami Heat. You I don't know. Face when that one came, I was like, "Oh, <laughs> I couldn't believe it!" What a question. Missoula somehow fucking didn't laugh or anything. I think he's much nice. It was. It had to be a member of the Miami media because I think he's nicer to them. But like, I was shocked when when Joe Missoula didn't kind of like punch that question down. But what a wild intro. You can't just make up a saying like that to just intro your question. Like that, that's there's not even three guarantees in the world. No one says that. That's a wild, just a wild approach to uh, press conference strategy. So I appreciated that to our friends down in South Beach. That was incredible, incredible stuff. Just a fantastic press conference moment. Uh, B Rob, J King, any other observations, junk or otherwise, before we wrap this up? here on the CLNS YouTube page. No, just that question. That's like a classic NBA finals, like someone trying to get on the radar type question. So now he didn't announce that. his affiliation. No, no, that's his mistake. That's his, if you want to propel yourself, you have to, you have to say where this is coming from. I want to be able to look up what blog you're doing. Uh, but now I'm going to have to wait for game four. Jay's going to have to track this guy down and, uh, and get, give us some more information. Well, then uh, I was watching like the Celtics Instagram feed of the press conference. And like, I think Jay was like being wait to pass the mic. And they're like, oh, yeah, he's right here in the white hat. And I was like, yeah, that's, <laughs> I know exactly what Jay's wearing right now. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that's the still potable difference, folks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please go to patreon.com slash still potable. We will be here every single day, Monday through Friday. The best Celtics podcast there is. Um, please subscribe. Uh, join this community. We have the chat is popping off during every single one of these games. It's a fun little community we have created and we'd really appreciate if you guys like this free episode, go to patreon.com slash still potable subscribe today. We'll be back every single day throughout the rest of the playoffs with more excellent Celtics content from B Rob of MassLive.com, from J King of the athletic and from me, just a guy on the internet. We very much appreciate it. Uh, and we'll be back tomorrow with more Still Potable. Jay, I'm just going to keep talking until you can get that song ready again because that's a new version of the song, and I want to hear it again. And so this is just me vamping, me uh, talking. We can talk about what else happened in uh, the rest of the league. Let's go. Let's go, you motherfucking Celtics. Let's go, baby. Let's go. You motherfucking Celtics. Let's go. Let's go, baby. It's game three. Let's beat the heat down in Miami. Let's go, Celtics. No more farting. Double fuck you to Caleb Martin. Let's go, Celtics. I said, let's go. Let's go, you motherfucking Celtics. Let's go, baby. Let's go, you motherfucking Celtics. Let's go. Beautiful stuff.